Muhammad, Sayyidina Muhammad. First of all, I want to uh, introduce Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya, one of the great scholars of the Islamic community in the world globally, um, one of the foremost experts on the Islamic legal tradition. And it's very heartwarming and encouraging that in Italy you're having this conference looking for ways to extend friendship. Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya recently uh, spearheaded an initiative to revive a classical piece of Muslim history, which is the famous Constitution of Medina, uh, in which our Prophet, peace be upon him, put forward a unified uh, citizenship of all of the different communities. And so we're here with Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya to speak a little bit about what was behind that initiative and what we would like to hopefully see in the future. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Nabiya rahmati wa ala khali min al-Nabiyyina wa al-Muslim. Ayyuhu al-Aftiqa al-Musharikuna fi muntada sadaqa fi al-Umha uhajikum min huna min al-Ribaat wa أتمنى لكم عملا جيدا ومناقشات ذرية خصبة. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So the Sheikh began with prayers and peace, praising God and prayers and peace upon our Prophet and also on all of the other Prophets that have come. Extends greetings to our friends and brothers and sisters in Italy uh, that are participating in this conference that re is revolving around a very important concept of friendship. That I, I greet you from the city of Rabat in, in Morocco and I hope that your conference is one in which you accomplish great things that are beneficial, that your discussions are beneficial, that lead to ways of promoting friendship. One of the things that we have done uh, in, in order to promote friendship was our Marrakesh Declaration. And I've been asked really to discuss how that started, what the initiative was. And it developed, it, it basically uh, began uh, as a, uh, a very small initiative, but it began to develop and mature to the point where a relatively large number of Muslims and even people from other faith communities, including the Jewish, the Christian, the Hindu, the Buddhist communities, and some of the minority communities that in some ways represent really a type of spiritual museum in the Middle East because these are ancient communities that have been preserved over the centuries in that region. And they were able to live uh, in that region um, as protected minorities. But unfortunately, as you know, uh, events have occurred in the region. Uh, there are very dramatic events that have changed the situation uh, radically and have increased in their rapidity uh, and, and changing the very face of the Middle East, which we call it the Middle East because it's really the middle portion of the ancient world between the East and the West of the ancient world. These calamities which have occurred, uh, although they have socio and political and other dimensions, first and foremost they're egoistic calamities. They're calamities that begin with the selves involved in them. And uh, this came from obviously uh, many societal and national problems in the area, but the, this is because the, the peoples in that area, within themselves, they demanded and wanted changing in their social systems. Um, but as things began to break down, uh, problems became greater and greater, and the very social fabric began to, began to break down, which uh, created a lot of problems and confusions amongst the people, and also uh, minorities that began to be affected very negatively because of these changes. And so there was a really important need to reassess uh, how these people uh, could, could live together and restore these relationships because this is a very important uh, concern for all of us when you have multi-faith societies, when you have 
places where peoples of different religions and different customs are occurring in the very same geographical locations, how do we, uh, how do we promote conviviality? How do we promote uh, living together? And so there were forces in those areas that as these changes begin, be, began to occur, they actually wanted to go back to a type of past that they conceived in their minds. Um, but unfortunately, their conception was very negative and, in, in, and harmful conception of how people uh, should be uh, treated. And so they began to actually enlist and employ the sacred texts of their religion in a very negative way and really um, distorting its meanings. Uh, they, they were ill prepared to do that, in fact, uh, really not capable of doing it, but nonetheless they did that. And so from these experiences, we recognized a, a need to, uh, to reassess and to conceptualize uh, in a new way uh, the idea of these multi-faith groups living together uh, in ways that pr would, would promote uh, peaceful societies. If you had a siyaq of zaman wa mujtama'i wa kana la budda min raddi fi'lin من رجال الدين ومن المفكرين والمثقفين. So in the, in the conditions that the social conditions and the time that we found ourselves in, uh, the religious leaders actually had an obligation to respond, especially given the extremists were using sacred texts to justify their actions. So we needed to respond using the same weapons to show their mistakes and to reveal also texts from within our tradition that actually promoted conviviality, that promoted peace, that also promoted citizenship. Uh, and that citizenship itself uh, not only does not negate our religion uh, or uh, negate the idea that one is adhering uh, to Islam if they promote citizenship, but that the religion itself has principles that affirm uh, citizenship and affirm social equality and rights and responsibilities that the religion itself demands that we not discriminate based upon color or creed or gender or other religions. Uh, and so this is what we wanted to present. We had to have decisive proofs for these premises that we were promoting and um, that our religion uh, not only promoted peace, but it also promoted citizenship itself. And so we began uh, in 2012 in Nouakchott, the capital of, of the, uh, the country of Mauritania, with uh, a group of scholars, intellectuals, and also some ministers that were involved, uh, especially from the country of Morocco. And this was uh, uh, the goal of which was really to find uh, the basis for the ideas that we wanted to promote from within uh, our own religious tradition. And this led to really bringing out the Covenant of Medina, what's known as the Sahifa of Medina, the Covenant of Medina. Uh, it's also called the, uh, the Charter of Medina. And it was written uh, when our Prophet, the last Prophet, uh, came to Medina uh, after fleeing from Mecca due to the persecution that was occurring there. And he came with a group of emigrants uh, who emigrated from Mecca to Medina and when they came into Medina, which was a, a city that was very different from the, the city they were from because it was a multi-ethnic, uh, multi-faith uh, city. So there were, Jewish con uh, there were Jewish tribes that were there. There were also uh, converts to the new religion of Islam uh, from amongst the Arabs that lived there. And then there were also the polytheists uh, who were practicing a primitive form of nativist or animistic religion that existed there. And so the, 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 the constitution of Medina, it could, it, be, it could be likened to a constitution, had around 50 articles. And in, these, and in this constitution, it did not refer to minorities or majorities, but it treated each uh, group uh, involved in this covenant uh, as equals. Uh, for instance, there's one of the articles that said that the, the tribe of Alf, the Jewish tribe of Alf, is equal 
to the believers uh, from the Muslims and the others involved in this. And so this was very clear uh, in the text of the, the covenant itself and that the, res the responsibilities that all of them had to bear were equal responsibilities of protection uh, from any outside invasion. Um, but they also shared the same rights. So there was a type of equality that was very clear and demarcated in it. And so we considered this covenant as a sound foundation for the modern concept of citizenship. Uh, and so what, what we first needed to do was to show the a historical veracity of the the covenant itself, the charter, and then we needed to substantiate what was in the charter also by the Quran and the prophetic tradition uh, of the Islamic texts themselves, and and this is what we did. So we showed that in fact that this charter was not an anomaly but actually an extension of Islamic principles that were very clear. After that meeting, we, we then went to Tunisia and uh, we continued to study further and to engage in conversation and discussion about this. And then this led ultimately to uh, the country of Morocco uh, basically uh, supporting this initiative. And then with the permission of the king, Mohammed VI himself, uh, we had the conference. Now, it, the conference uh, was delayed, but that delay actually enabled us to bring together a wide variety of people from various backgrounds, from various religious traditions, but also from these minority communities that were persecuted uh, in the very areas that we were really attempting to address this problem. Um, and so what we felt was, was accomplished, that we were enabled to put forward a sound concept of the idea of Islamic citizenship that does not differ from the concept of contractual citizenship that many of you or all of you really are familiar with uh, that has been the source of great um, discussion and treatment by philosophers, by political scientists and others. And so we believe that we had really uh, made a sound and decisive argument to support a basis for citizenship in any Muslim country. And what's uh, really important to emphasize is that despite that, none of these extremists or whatever you want to call them will have been able to refute this declaration, despite the fact that it was translated into many languages, that it's been made available on the internet. And so our hope really is that this declaration is studied and supported by those people that are involved in citizenship and promoting citizenship, that are involved in promoting human rights. And we hope that it really becomes a source of peace, uh, especially in these areas that are particularly afflicted right now by conflicts, because these areas are in dire need of peace and in dire need of conviviality and promoting these concepts in these areas. And so at, at the heart of what we're engaged in are the concepts of, of brotherly love, of peace, of mercy, of promoting the common weal amongst people. These are foundations that we believe are really the foundations of all of our re revealed religions. And so this is what we are involved in promoting and this is uh, at the heart of what the Marrakesh Declaration was. And so we're, we're asking uh, for others to help us. And our hope is that this will spread, that people will spread this message. And so I just want to uh, thank all of you and extend uh, my uh, brotherly love and friendship to all of you that are also there attempting to promote uh, friendship and brotherhood